worst crisis to afflict capitalism over the you know for the last 60 or 70 years the scale of it has been quite staggering let me just remind you the privatized mortgage companies Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac collapsed shares plunged by 90 percent were put under government control Lehman Brothers went bankrupt shotgun marriages were initiated and marrying off one big bank to another massive bailouts as dowry for the new wedding <laughs> and it's the largest dowry that has been paid to a corporate couple or couples because it was a collective wedding which now runs into trillions of dollars 10 to 15 percent unemployment in the United States 20 percent in Spain Greece became completely overstretched because it's a global crisis and its economy collapsed and a whole country had to be bailed out so the features of neoliberalism as an economic project again we now know because they've been in action for 20 25 years destruction of existing structures deindustrialization privatization of state utilities deregulation and a link between money and politics that has now reached such a level that it makes a farce of democratic functioning and in the united states this is now an art form uh, the lobby system uh, sort of membership of the senate but what i forgot to say is that where were the arab american or palestinian billionaires because at least they should have bought 10 senators <laughs> You know, I'm not saying asking for too much. Ten senators, <laughs> ten senators and possibly 40 congressmen would have helped to have some opposition. And since it takes money to do this, let's buy them. <laughs> Unfortunately, the left can't buy them because we don't have any money. But that is a system which Sheldon Wallin is now calling Democracy Inc. from his perch at Princeton. And it is disturbing a lot of political scientists in the United States. So this is the context in which Barack Obama comes to power. What was the campaign? What did he promise in the campaign? If you think about it, and I've just been rereading most of his campaign speeches. And it's very fine words and beautifully delivered and uplifting, but largely vacuous. Promised very little, and he was very careful about that. It wasn't an accident that very little was promised. And even on health care, the uh, big issue of the campaign already in the primary campaign he had begun to back down and the final retreat we saw in in what took place is that the insurance companies and their lobbyists essentially wrote the health care bill so that the insurance companies will make even more money under this health care bill curiously enough the position of both hillary clinton and edwards was a bit more progressive and in fact if you want to see a bill a proposed bill that was even more progressive you have to go and see the proposals which Nixon made <laughs> I'm not kidding Nixon's health care bill a number of active doctor activists in the states tell me we would be prepared to die for it now and then Kennedy Edward Kennedy tried to amalgamate his own proposals with Nixon's proposals and push them, them through. That failed. 
And the lobby against it at that time was the American Medical Association, basically fat cat doctors who didn't want to lose money and thought they were doing quite well by the system. And we now have a huge problem because given the extent of the crisis, in my opinion, this government or the successor government, because the reforms so-called will not come into effect till 2019 when even if Obama wins a second term, he will have left. Uh, so we don't know what the effects are going to be or whether they will even be able to afford to fund it. So in terms of domestic politics, nothing progressive was promised, neither on health nor on education. And on education, those of you who live in this particular city should know what's been going on. And the experimentation that has been taking place and what Arne Duncan actually represents. Corporate education, privatized education, sell off the rich schools to the corporations and teach them financial speculation and sell off the poor schools to the naval and military academy so that the poor kids don't have to think twice, they are pushed straight into the war machine. And this is what the Chicago politicians locally have done and this is where Obama comes from. Now, the second point to understand about him I, I was at the talk yesterday where people spoke, and I, of course I fully understand. I felt quite sort of excited myself at the sight of an Afro-American family entering the White House. Who could not? And for a variety of reasons. It was an emotional event, and the whole world shared the emotion. Because you don't, when you elect an American president, you're electing one of the, the principal ruler of the world. He's an imperial president. So there was that feeling of emotion that a house built by slaves was now going to be lived in by at least one half of a family which were the descendants of slaves. No one should underestimate the impact of that. Very important. But we have to now move beyond it because you know, you can celebrate that fact, but ultimately the deciding feature and the deciding factor, in my opinion, is neither race nor gender, but politics. That you determine who people are, not by what they say, but by what they do. That has to be the only criteria. And of course, we know what the right and far right in this country is and the support they have goes without saying they attack Obama all the time and what do they attack him for for being a socialist <laughs> if only <laughs> they attack him for being colored that he can't help he is and they attack him for crazy uh, things. And they did the same with Bill Clinton, if you will recall, when he was in power. And if Hillary had won the election, we would have had an orgy of misogyny in this country. So it's, it's the same, actually. When the right loses, they go bananas. And in this case, <laughs> more than, more than uh, 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 before, because it's a very big event and they, they can see it like that. But the way to tackle them, this is where the big mistake has been made, the way to tackle them is not by being conciliatory. Because if you are conciliatory to your political opponents, you lose many of the supporters who actually pushed you into power. And that means you lose the next time because you haven't done anything to justify the support of those who were moved by you, who came to your campaigns, who dragged their parents out to vote for you. And you slap them in the face because they 
you take them for granted. And that's a very dangerous thing to do in politics, whether politics of the left or mainstream politics, to take your support for granted. It has to be earned. So if we look beyond domestic policies now to Obama's foreign policies, <coughs> we find a situation where the continuities with the previous regime are all there. And I was never one of those who said that the United States had been hijacked by a bunch of far-right extremists behaving in a totally irrational way. Uh, because, you know, it's to forget what history is when you talk like that. I mean, we know perfectly well that this is an imperial state. And this is an imperial state in which Democrats and Republicans, when they've been in power, have carried out what they think are the interests of that state. So to get totally worked up by, by W, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, pretend that he was somehow unusual, well, it's not even that he was unusual on the level of intelligence, because we'd had Reagan before him. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the fact is that when you have presidents who are not totally in command of politics, you have around them a team of people that I call the American Capitalist Politburo. <laughs> and the Politburo runs the state. They did it under Reagan quite cleverly from their point of view. And they did it under Bush Jr. from their point of view quite cleverly. They weren't people we like, obviously. But in terms of what they did, they took Iraq. They have now control of Iraqi oil. For the next 25 years, all the old corporations involved in the oil industry are going and taking that oil. Of course, it's been a disaster on other levels for them. But in terms of economics, it's not been a total disaster of getting hold <clears throat> of the oil, which wasn't the only reason, of course, for invading that country but it was one of the reasons to be able to control it so you could determine who it sold to. And they did it. And one of them actually said, I can't remember which member of the American Politburo it was, ruling Politburo, who said, we did it because we could. Meaning, who's there to challenge us? This is the way we will preserve and exercise our, our hegemony. Now, Iraq, as you know, was an incredibly divisive issue in this country. I think the reason Obama won the nomination, one big reason was that when he was uh, in the Illinois Senate, he voted against the war. Once. <laughs> Fine. He did it. Better that than voting for it. And Hillary and her husband were still warmongers. Bill Clinton traveled around Europe telling European Social Democratic parties to support the Iraq war. It was absolutely vital. But when Obama comes to power, it's forgotten, the opposition, and it carries on. You know, the surge has been so successful that a few months ago General Petraeus was saying, he was asked, is the surge successful? He said, yeah, we're only having 15 attacks a day on the US forces. Well, that is a measurement of success, I suppose, on one level. But it doesn't show that the situation is completely under control. But if we can see that in Palestine, Israel, in Iraq, Obama is continuing with the policies of the previous government. The policies he has made his own are escalating the war in Afghanistan and expanding it in Pakistan. And he promised this. That was the one pledge he did make during the election. And I remember many arguing with people here who were saying he doesn't really mean it. He's just saying it because he's opposed to the Iraq war. Uh, and, you know, he can't allow the right to completely out. So he has to be tough in another. I said, no, no, he means it. <laughs> the way it was said. He obviously meant it. And there was a debate going on in the US administration 
at that time and still as to whether the best way forward is to send more troops or to prepare an exit strategy. That was and remains a debate going on. Otherwise, there is no way you can understand the public discussion between General Eikenberry and Petraeus, where Eikenberry, as US ambassador in Kabul, sends a public message, not a private one, saying, we don't want 30,000 more troops. Unheard of in a war situation and occupation for two senior figures to be arguing which showed that there was a division. And that division, uh, w which, which remains, in my opinion, Obama came down on the side of those who were for the surge, because that is what he had argued for, probably in consultations with some of the people inside the military. And that war is now turning out, as many of us predicted, a total and complete disaster. <coughs> They are fed up with their puppet ruler there, Karzai. And whereas in the good old days, they just have bumped him off and replaced him with someone else, as they did many a time in South Vietnam. If someone didn't suit their needs, get rid of him and find someone else. In Afghanistan, it's not so easy to find someone else. <laughs> that is, and Karzai knows it. Because lots of puppet rulers, suddenly they've been kept in power so long, suddenly begin to think we really are important. <laughs> and we can do without the Americans. We can do without NATO. Well, we'll see. I doubt it. And they make so much money like Karzai and his family have, and they buy a limited base of support with money, that they think that that makes them popular. Well, you know, they don't know how much they are hated because they are cut off from all that world. So essentially, they have a very weak regime in Afghanistan. Very different from Iraq, by the way, where the Shias constitute a majority in the confessional Shia parties they had been cultivating. It's a mess in Iraq because you have ethnic cleansings and uh, all that and, and uh, horrific acts being committed, as even The Economist in an uh, editorial had to point out, that we seem to be back in the old Saddam Hussein days. Oppositionists are being tortured, people are being locked up, nothing seems to have changed at all, except that the people doing it are the people we support. But in Afghanistan, they don't have that particular option, because a majority of the population are Pashtuns, from the southern part of the country, the Shia and the Hazarawals are a relatively small minority, and you can't have a solution in that country unless you want to balkanize it, uh, which would be crazy, despite the discovery of huge lithium fields underneath the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be crazy to balkanize it, though it's something that they might well consider. Who knows? But at the moment, they're in a total mess, which is why they are discussing openly now with the Taliban. I mean, for years we were told this was the worst, most evil organization in the world. And it certainly isn't an organization I've ever supported. <clears throat> but nonetheless, the United States are now going into serious negotiations with the Taliban uh, and pleading with them to join the government in Kabul with Karzai's support. The Taliban's position, actually for them quite a principled position, is it's very difficult for us to join any coalition government as long as there are foreign troops on our soil, which is not a stupid position. And once you go, then we will certainly join a coalition government with A, B, and C as we see fit uh, to, to, to have a, a sovereign state. That is their position at the moment, but they are still trying to split them, aided by the Pakistani military and the Pakistani political elite, who are trying to win over elements of the Taliban, uh, the good Taliban, so-called, 
because whether you're good or bad depends on how close you are to the United States. This is a, a criteria all over the world for governments and political parties and politicians. Um, but it's not going to be easy for them to do it. And the other thing in Afghanistan which is worth noting is that the Taliban told all their supporters if they come and try on, that when they come into villages and say we want to recruit some of you to train you to be police, good policemen in the army, go. A, a limited number of them go into the official structures of the occupied state to get military training, to learn how to use weapons. And there was this, you know, three big incidents. One was a guy who they thought was completely on their side, recruited by the CIA, who went in and shot the top intelligence officials of the NATO powers in Afghanistan. And they were surprised. Why the hell are you surprised? Every guerrilla insurgent organization tries to do that. The Algerians did it, the Vietnamese did it. Whatever ideology you are, there is a certain logic to resisting. And unless you're completely crazy, uh, you try and infiltrate. So they now say, investigators, intelligence investigators from NATO say we, we can't totally depend on the police force and the army because we don't know the degree to which it has been infiltrated. Well, then you give up. <laughs> you know, if you can't do that, then it is best to cut your losses and get out. Obama hasn't done that so far. And I think that this is going to be, whether it'll be his Vietnam, as many people are arguing, I don't know. It's not an analogy I particularly like to use in relation to Afghanistan on most levels. But on the level of being able, I think the war is unwinnable for both sides. The United States can't win the war, nor can they lose it. The Taliban can't win the war, but it's difficult for them to lose it because they live there. So unless you have a permanent occupation, indefinite occupation, this business is going to go on. We already discussed yesterday the position of uh, Obama and the new government on Palestine, Israel. No big change. You know, no big change was expected. In fact, Obama, before he was uh, ensconced, or was it after, I can't now quite remember, went to the big APAC conference and said that he was in favor of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, which had not been said by any American president till now. And they had to retract a bit. Even the Israelis must have been a bit taken aback. <laughs> So he had to retract a bit. But his position on, uh, on Israel-Palestine was very much, you know, it was obvious what it was going to be when he appointed his new chief of staff. A sort of, you know, uh, tried and uh, uh, trusted and tested Zionist Doberman, who's been a, a member of the IDF, fought inside the IDF as a staunch Zionist, as is his family in, in Israel. There's no big secret about it. So we were obviously not going to have any big changes on that. Were we going to have any big changes in the Far East? When the Japanese, after decades, chucked out the Liberal Democratic Party government, which, I mean, Japan had been run at a one-party client state. And this party had been in power. Finally, you had an opposition party winning, and the reason they won was that they pledged that they would ask American troops to leave Okinawa and find some other place to settle down. They were told by Gates, that's if people are, don't think there is continuity, you look at the personnel that have been appointed. Gates continues at the Pentagon. Panetta Clinton's old crony, when he was appointed to the uh, head of the CIA, uh, said that he was not uh, you know, uh, uh, opposed to most of the things that had been done, and he was certainly not in favor of, being, of revealing CIA secrets because we were living in difficult times. His uh, 
big legal officer who's now being nominated for the Supreme Court, Ms. Kagan. I mean, the, this is total diversion, whether she's gay or not gay, which I read on the American blogs. Who the hell cares? What is far more worrying is what her politics are. And her politics are extremely reactionary. You know, she defended renditions. The senior legal officer, the head of the Yale Law Department, who's like the sort of pope of the American legal system, is now a senior State Department lawyer. A few weeks ago, he gave a speech. Some big convention on international law in the United States, and he said that the use of drones was not illegal. In other words, the U.S. can use drones in any part of the world, or is this a privilege just for Pakistan? They use them, of course, in Somalia, and they've used some of them in Yemen. So they were told that drones were now legal. Just imagine if these remarks had been made by senior people within the Bush administration. All hell would have broken loose. And these are double standards you have to try and avoid. When Bush did A, B, and C, he was attacked. When the Obama administration does the same thing, people try and look for excuses. But you know, the excuses are no longer there. Ask yourself, could he have become president had he not been deeply committed to the system? And become president through the Chicago machine? <laughs> which was backing him through hell and high water? And when Daly wanted to punish Bobby Rush for running against him, what did he do? He got Obama to challenge him in the primaries. Obama failed. But the challenge, he agreed to challenge him. Well, why had Rush had the nerve to challenge Daly? If you read Ricky Hendon's book about what happened in the Illinois Senate when they were trying to push through cuts in the poorest areas of Chicago, Obama, then a member of that Illinois Senate, voted for all the cuts. And, and when Hendon went and confronted him and said, what the hell do you, th do you think you're doing? He said, and this is an Afro-American sen senator, by the way, Hendon. When he said, what the hell are you doing? You're voting for the cuts which are going to deprive black people in Chicago, Afro-American, and poor communities of everything which they're pushing through. He said, Obama looked at me icily and said, we have to be fiscally prudent. This is in Hendon's memoirs. And then when, <clears throat> when it came to cuts on the South Side, he didn't know they were coming. He then got up and made a big speech attacking them, but then they were voted through. And there were fisticuffs between him and Hendon outside. It's, an, it's quite an astonishing piece of uh, writing in Hendon's uh, memoirs. So the fisticuffs are with an Afro-American colleague who's to your left. At least it's uh, you know, quite positive in a way. It shows he can be aggressive. <laughs> but against his own side, people on his left, Afro-Americans. Not against these people who he's trying to, to conciliate. So it's not a good story, and it, it might end badly. The big obsession of the Obama administration is to get a second term. Fine, but for what? To do what? And that's a question that we must always pose that, you know, it is not enough. Look, surely politics matters. Otherwise, we could argue that the Republicans did more in promoting black politicians to the top. Condi Rice, Colin Powell, Reagan promoted Clarence Thomas first, and then another Republican put him in the Supreme Court. Three big positions. Condi was a uh, you know, national security advisor to Bush. They were black. Afro-Americans, were they not? Did we just say that's fine? No. They were attacked from within the Afro-American community because people didn't like the politics they were pursuing. 
And Clarence Thomas, by the way, used to be a Black Panther once upon a time. I don't know how many of you knew that. It's an awful thought, but he was. <laughs> so th that's, that's what's happened. So the criteria for judging has to be a political criteria. It can't be a good man fallen amongst bad people. Because the good man, give him some credit, he's an extremely intelligent man. He knows how he got in and what he's doing. And to be perfectly frank with you, his politics are not good. He is not part of that radical Afro-American tradition. He's post all that, like many other Afro-American politicians. Jesse Jackson was the last of those who would go and fight for uh, you know, trade unionists when the mood took him. He would go and defend the poor. And he was pretty effective at it, Jesse, when he did it. But that was the last of the old generation. And with the big shift to the right that took place, it was always foolish to imagine that many radicals, Afro-American radical intellectuals, would not go with that shift. Many did, unfortunately. And politics changed. And the new politics were meant to be post all that. Post socialist, they said, in Europe. Post liberal, they said, here, as they pushed through neoliberalism. That has been the way these people were formed. Now, I want to end on, uh, given what this conference is, on a different note. And that is, very straightforwardly, why are we socialists today? Why? We know times are bad. In fact, if you like, they haven't been as bad as this ever, because at least you had strong labor movements. And you had all sorts of parties, huge parties, communist parties, social democratic parties, which defended some form of anti-capitalist reforms, different style of politics. Now that has gone, by and large. And the number of people defending socialism are much, much smaller than they have ever been. But that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be defended and argued for and fought for. And when you hear right-wing ideologues talking all over the place, socialism failed, the response to that is, yeah, we failed once. How many times has capitalism failed? <laughs> And the reason for the big failure was also rooted in history and politics and economics. There was a total contrast between the vision of a socialist society sketched by Marx and the reality of what existed in the 20th century states that defined themselves as socialists. This wasn't due to good people or bad people, but economically, these these Revolutions took place in countries which were austere and backward. Their total output constrained by scarcities, a low productivity of labor. That was not what had been thought up by the founders of socialism. In fact, when Trotsky once was asked, what do you, which country do you think is most ripe for socialism, being a good Marxist, he replied, the United States of America, because of the level of productive forces. And one tends to forget that. But you know, ultimately, history and economics caught up with these societies. Politically, they were dominated by authoritarian state apparatuses, which denied civic liberties, expropriated the rights of organization and association. Culturally, they imposed an official monopoly on the means of communication, a repressive regulation of ideas, the exaltation of the nation. Bureaucracy became the master of all social life. 
All this was remote from the early expectations of all of them, by the way. Even the leaders of the Russian Revolution who made it didn't want it to go in that way. Because socialism was meant to be based on the economics of what? Abundance. Political order should be what? Based on a radical popular sovereignty in which the producers of wealth would be given for the first time ever the means of democratic self-government in factories, fields, municipalities, assemblies, and on a national level. That culture would be diverse and variegated, moving beyond all existing boundaries, beyond capital and beyond nation. So we have to see this as a long transition probably now which will be a transition even longer than the transition from feudalism to capitalism. That is how we have to see a transition from capitalism to socialism. It's going to be a long haul. And the big difference between a transition to socialism and a transition to capitalism is the following, that socialism was always a conscious movement of people knowing where they were going, knowing the reasons why they were going, and being very realistic and hard-headed about what it needed to get there. And it's a long way away. And because we are, it seems longer, we then get upset and angry by many things, including Obama. But you know, Obama essentially is a Democrat politician, a very clever one talks very well, very slick. He is no more than that. And it is foolish and it's actually unfair to Obama to imagine that he is more than that. He has never said he's more than that. So why should we imagine it? Because we ourselves are desperate for something more. But that is fine. He is not or the Democrats are not going to supply it. They never have, and they're not going to, with Obama, with Hillary Clinton, with whoever. It's not going to work out like that, because that is not how politics changes. Politics changes when you have mass movements from below. That is what helped to bring about the New Deal, which we now think was a great golden age. It wasn't so golden, but in any case, it was better than what followed. But it happened because of the big, big movements from below, which we see in South America today, which is why those politicians are much, much better than anything else anywhere else in the world. They are being pushed from below to change things. And because they believe in change themselves, they are actually beginning to change something. Structural reforms are being pushed through by them. A long way from revolution, but important structural reforms. So one has got to take the long view, because one thing we should remember, that the golden age is not behind us. The golden age lies ahead of us. the support, logistic support of the Pakistani military, they could never have taken Kabul when they first did. And that dependence on the Pakistani military still exists. Uh, it's now done clandestinely, of course, but you know, the US knows what goes on. Uh, now they don't even mind so much because they need something there. Uh, but so when I talk about a coalition government, it will not be because some of the old leaders of the Taliban like Mullah Omar are in favor of it, but because that is the direction in which the Pakistani military will probably push because the big obsession of the Pakistani military is the Indian presence in Afghanistan, which isn't so much a military presence, but it certainly is a political presence. And in order to get that rid of that, there they'll be prepared to do deals with the Iranians in the West and with the Russians and the Northern Alliance people to set up some sort of a national government, uh, which the Chinese are saying behind the scenes that they will fund. 
I mean, the Chinese are already there, by the way, you know, uh, economically, uh, that they will fund. So it will be very difficult. I may be wrong, but I don't think so on this. I think it will be very difficult for them to uh, construct a sort of regime which they did when they first took over on the heels of the Civil War, because uh, this is a country now which has been at war continuously since 1979. Think about it. Longer than the First World War, longer than the Second World War, longer than the Viet last Third Vietnam War, longer now than the Iran-Iraq War. And that begins to have an effect on the psychology and the everyday life of the people. They are fed up of the war. So any coalition government which says no war, disarmament, 10 years of peace, reconstruction, it will be difficult for any group, I would say even the Umar group within the Taliban to reject that. Of course, you know, there are many people there who will say we want now to create an emirate again like we did before, but I think there are others who will say to them this is not a good idea. Uh, and those others are in Islamabad. Um, I agree that Obama talked about, you know, at APEC when he talked about Jerusalem, said uh, he was in favor of an undivided Jerusalem. I am too, if you want my position. <laughs> but I am in favor of an undivided Jerusalem, which is the capital of a unified one state with equal rights for all, as I argued last night. You know, so uh, I, I don't think that is, that is, uh, uh, what he intended. He was basically trying to explain to APEC that the fact that his middle name was a Muslim name shouldn't be taken too seriously, and he was quite right about that. It shouldn't. <laughs> um, I really don't want to get involved in this debate between the Socialist Equality Party and Socialist Worker. Uh, it's I don't read the paper regularly, though my own instincts, if anything, I have to be honest with you, would be with Socialist Worker for the following reason. I was in the United States a great deal during the Obama campaign. And people who would come to my talks on whatever subject it was, largely young people, would always ask at these events, they'd put their hands up and say, if you were in this country, would you vote for Obama? And I'm going to shock you. But I, unlike socialist worker, I said I probably would. And at the, I said it because it's not untrue, but also because I was very heartened by the involvement of so many young people, a new generation in politics. You know, people don't come to politics fully formed. Always there's a process of change. And the best way for people to learn is not through what older people or people from my generation or whoever tells them. The best way for people to learn, and that is the way they learn, is through their own experience. And I think that is the way that people will learn. That is the way people will learn uh, and are learning. And that, and the don't think the Obama administration isn't uh, aware of it. The second term with which they are obsessed in a crazy way obsessed. They think they get it through reconciliation with their enemies. And what they forget, as I said, is the people who put them in. So how are they going to win these people back is a problem for them because many of them have learned. Not enough, we could say, but many people are extremely pissed off with what they are witnessing. And that is educating them much more than any of us could do. But that is the way people learn in you know, huge swathes of people learn, not, not um, individuals. Um, uh, when I talk about the importance of politics, you know, I don't need to spell it out. Obviously, when I talk about politics, it is politics in the interests of working people, low-income families, people who are ignored by the system. That's the sort of politics I'm in favor of, and how to mobilize them. I mean, you know, what do you do when you go into a, a, an area where people are struggling for basic things, for their houses not to be repossessed and taken up? 
but they at the same time, you know, large numbers of Afro saying, well, we, you know, we're still giving Obama a chance. What do you say to them, you're traitors? You know, we're going to shoot you dead? <laughs> no. You explain to them and work with them and hope that they will understand as their struggles proceed. So it's from that point of view, it remains an interesting time. Of course, we have to spell out very clearly what we think. The big problem is systemic. And that's something you can't get away from. Uh, but that's the, that, that's the way um, I would do it. Um, the question asked about, about the Supreme Court ruling on corporate finance. Look, that was such a scandal that not only Democrats, but many moderate Republicans were shocked by that particular decision, as they should be. On the other hand, if you look at it completely cold-bloodedly, all the Supreme Court was doing, and given its function in this society, was saying that this system exists, so we might as well recognize it. I mean, you know, don't ignore that fact. We can attack it, and we should attack it, but the big problem is not what the Supreme Court said, which is bad, but what actually exists today in, a, in the way in which the political system and its links to the corporations uh, 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 function. Now, I don't think these, these links are going to be attacked by this administration if the health care bill is anything to go by or what is happening on other fronts. Uh, the same thing applies, I agree, about the domestic militarization programs, the, some things that were promised, like the total disbandment of uh, Guantanamo and the trial of prisoners in courts of law, elementary things, which quite honestly, you don't have to be that progressive to be in favor of. You know, they are elementary. Even these things haven't been, haven't been pushed through. Because once a state get in, gets involved, in emergency politics, and the United States has been in an emergency since the Second World War, and then the Cold War created its own emergencies, and then we had the War of Terror emergency, so emergency politics become a way of life for the people in power, and they don't like relinquishing any of those rights which they have acquired, executive power for instance, and what it can do, and a totally weak and tame Congress and Senate. So uh, the, the, this attack on civil liberties will continue, and what they don't understand, you know, is that the militarization, the attacks on immigrants, the border wall, this is the United States doing this? A country of immigrants? saying, you know, we've climbed up the ladder and got here, now we're chucking the ladder away forever. You can't do it. It's not going to work. I mean, uh, you know, and when the Hispanic population mobilized on that one day or on the strike, it was very powerful, and they will do so again if this carries on. I mean, you know, the, what are we waiting for in Arizona now, for a cactus nacht? <laughs> Um, Brazil, Iran, and Turkey. Well, look, these are long subjects, and uh, you know, uh, but I think what, what we are witnessing is something quite interesting, that regional powers saying that we're not going to totally tow the U.S. line. This, in the Cold War days, the world was divided on Cold War lines. There was the Warsaw Pact, there was NATO, there were the non-aligned movement. Uh, which took up independent positions led by Yugoslavia, Tito, Nehru of India, Nasser of Egypt, saying we are not part of any camp, but often taking up anti-imperialist positions. And when they took them up, they had more credibility, to be, to be frank. So that world all disappeared in the 90s with the fall of the Berlin Wall when the American power and capitalism and imperialism became hegemonic. There was no challenge to them. Slowly challenges built up. And the continent where these challenges built up the most was South America. One after the other, they broke. 
with neoliberalism and with the right of the US to dominate their continent. Mexico too would have gone if they hadn't rigged the elections. But they rigged them pretty badly and pretty openly. You know, there are documentaries made about it which actually show what happened to quite a lot of the ballot boxes. They filmed them. So Mexico didn't make that move uh, because the elections were rigged, but other parts of South America did. Now, the interesting thing about Brazil, to the comrade who asked, that Lula is um, on domestic politics remained a loyal neoliberal. But what he did break from was a pattern where every Brazilian government did the bidding of the United States. And this Lula refused to do because he knew it was not popular in Brazil, among, certainly not popular amongst the majority of his supporters. So when Evo Morales was elected in Bolivia and he was asked to destabilize Bolivia, he said no. I'm not going to do it with Morales. I'm not going to do it with Chavez. That time has gone. And they didn't like hearing that, but he did it. Uh, <clears throat> what is interesting about the Brazilians linking up with the Turks to stop sanctions by getting the Iranians to agree to the measures which the US administration was asking them a year and a half ago? They've done it. But the fact is, it's got nothing to do with any of that. They, they, the pressure on Iran comes exclusively from Israel. There's no two ways about that, to preserve their nuclear monopoly in the region. That is where the pressure comes from. And the fact that the Brazilians did it is not without interest, because the Brazilians have been trying for the last 10 years to become a permanent member of the Security Council. And in order to become a permanent member of the Security Council, you have to have the approval of the United States. I mean, the others follow, but the U U.S. Ha there's no way they're going to agree to that now. Because they will say, had Brazil been a member of the Security Council, it would have vetoed this, this proposal. So they're going to do that. The Turkish thing is even more interesting because it's a NATO country. Uh, under the NATO treaty, it could have invoked that its ship had been attacked in the public seas and its citizens killed and asked on NATO to come and protect it. Uh, he missed a trick there because, yeah. because of who he is. You know, they're essentially, the, the government in, in Turkey, are, you know, quite conservative on many things. A bit like Christian Democrats, except that they're Muslims. Uh, and that is how they... That is how they, uh, they, they, they operate. But the fact that they feel obliged to do it is also linked to their own needs in the region. And they are playing a larger and larger role. They are not happy at the big role that the Israelis are playing in Kurdistan and Iraq, which is basically an uh, Israeli-US protectorate. Big, big Israeli business interests present there. And this is also encouraging uh, the Turkish Kurds, who the Turkish government, successive Turkish governments have been sitting on. So it's linked in to, to, to all that, what the Turks are doing now.